In this video, I'll be showing you my workflow for photo scanning assets. In case you're unfamiliar with photo scanning, what it allows you to do is make a fully textured 3D mesh from photos of an object. There are three pieces of software we'll be using, all of which are free. Let's start with Meshroom. Meshroom is the software we'll be bringing our images into in order to get a 3D model out. However, the model that Meshroom gives you will be way too high in geometry to be practically used in anything. That's where Instant Meshes comes in. Instant Meshes will allow us to reduce the topology of an object with just a few clicks. Finally, in order to get detail from our high poly mesh onto our low poly mesh, we'll be using Blender 2.8 to bake the diffuse and normal map textures. Links to all of these pieces of software can be found in the description of the video. For this project, you're also going to need a camera. Your phone camera should work just fine. However, my phone is barely functional, so for the sake of my sanity, I'll just be using my Canon T6. You're also going to, of course, need something to photo scan. When picking something to photo scan, there are a couple things to keep in mind. Certain objects don't tend to photo scan well. These include translucent or transparent objects, objects that are really reflective or glossy, and thin objects such as leaves or other foliage. For my example, I'll be using a statue of St. Jude. So once you have all the necessary prerequisites, it's time to get started taking photos of your subject. When setting up your subject, the first thing you need to keep in mind is that you want it to be softly lit. You want to try to avoid harsh shadows because they'll get built into the image textures for the object, which is undesirable. We want our shadows to be generated physically by the 3D software of choice. A simple and effective way to achieve soft lighting is to bring your object outside on an overcast day. However, the downfall of this is that you're stuck waiting on nature. In my case, it's currently sunny, and so I'll make do with the lighting that I have. Indoor lighting is something I'm still trying to master myself, and so my results may not be perfect, but they'll work for the sake of demonstration. When preparing your camera, you want to make sure to disable auto white balance and any other settings that will adjust automatically, as they can change the look from photo to photo and mess up your scan. Depending on what camera you use, you'll have to look up the specific instructions on how to do so. When shooting photos, the goal is to get as many good quality shots from as many angles as possible. There are two ways you can go about doing this. You can leave the subject in place and physically move around it taking photos, or you can leave the camera in place and rotate the object. Since I'm shooting in my room, I'll be rotating the object. I just want to note that although my subject is being shot in front of a green screen, it serves no purpose other than to contrast the object from the background and is 100% not needed for this to work. In most cases, I would hang a white sheet behind my object and try to create a sort of light box effect. However, because this statue is mostly white, I don't want to risk confusing the software. Another thing I want to note is that I will not be scanning the bottom of this object as I really don't need it in my case. However, if I wanted the bottom of this statue, I would simply finish shooting it standing up and then lay it on its back and begin rotating it that way. I honestly just don't want to risk breaking or damaging the statue though. So once you begin shooting, make sure your object is in focus and that you're trying to get every angle you possibly can. The more pictures you take, the more information the software has to work with. However, the more pictures also means more time to process. I tend to take at least 100 photos, but usually more. Once you've taken your photos and are happy with what you have, it's time to move on to Meshroom. So once you download Meshroom, you're going to have a zipped file and you're going to want to extract the folder inside of that zip file to wherever you'd like. Inside of that folder will be the executable file that you'll run to open Meshroom. And when you run it, this is what you'll see. On the left hand side is where we'll be putting our images. In the middle here, you'll be able to preview each image. Over here is where you'll get your outputted mesh. And down here is the graph editor. Now I won't go too deeply into these nodes because I'll be leaving them the way they are for the most part. However, on the texturing tab, if you click on it, you'll see a bunch of settings come up and there may be some things you want to change here. In my case, I'm going to take this texture downscale and I'm going to put it to 1 because I want my textures to be 8192 by 8192. You can also change the file type if you'd like and the unwrap method. Now, I'm leaving it on basic and that's going to give me more than one texture file. But because we're baking this, that really shouldn't matter. So at this point, it's probably a good idea to make a project folder and put all your images in there. You're also going to want to save your Meshroom file. Once you have your images and you're happy with them, you're going to want to drag them in right over here. Now, I know it says I have 779 images, but that's actually incorrect. My camera is set to shoot both RAW and JPEG photos. I'm going to be going through this and removing the duplicates. So I probably have somewhere closer to 300 to 400 images. 
This is probably a lot more than what's necessary, but I just wanted to play on the safe side and give the software as much information as possible. So once your images have loaded in, you'll be able to see a preview of the one you have selected over here in this window here. It's a good idea at this point to go through and delete any blurry images because they can mess up your photo scan. Once you're happy with the images you have, you're going to want to come up here and click start. Now what's going to happen is it's going to move from this node to the right. If you select each node, you can see certain attributes for them and in the log you can see what it's doing. Now an issue that you might run into upon clicking start is this node failing, the camera init node or the camera initialize node. And the reason for this will probably be that your camera is not in the database. So there's a couple of pieces of information about your camera that you have to give to Meshroom. What you're going to want to do if you have this issue is you're going to want to navigate to the folder where you put Meshroom. You're going to click on Alice Vision. You're going to go to Share, Alice Vision, and you're going to look for this camera sensors database file. You're going to want to open it with your text editor of choice. I'm just going to use Notepad. Now, by default, it will probably have a whole bunch of cameras in here. I don't know if this is an issue that still exists with the current version of Meshroom, but when I tried to add my camera into the database file that it provided for me, for some reason it didn't work. It had something to do with the way that the other cameras in that database file were laid out. So I simply just selected everything and deleted it and just added in my camera's information. I figure in the worst case scenario, if I have to use another camera, I'll just come back and add it to the list. So if you're running to that issue as well, that's a simple fix for it. So the information that you have to find is your camera's make, your camera's model, and the sensor width. And you're going to lay it out just like this. There's an article on the, mesh, on the Alice Vision Meshroom GitHub that I will link in the description below that explains all of this. And depending on the camera you use, you're going to have to Google some of this information. But it should be available somewhere on the internet. So once you finish that and you click start, you'll see a loading bar appear right here and on this node. And it'll go through these nodes one by one. The majority of the time will probably be spent on the depth map and it'll be higher or lower depending on how many pictures you've taken. As you can see with 777 photos loaded, this is going to go through the depth map uh, over 258 times. Now as I said, I'm going to be reducing the number of images here, so it'll be less than that. But it's just something to keep in mind. So when you're ready, go ahead and click start. Okay, so here we are. Mine is finished. My scan is finished and there are a couple of things to note. You probably won't see any of these warnings on these nodes. I believe I'm getting these because I actually did the scan on a different computer so that I could continue to use my computer while the scanning was happening. And it looks as though that version of Meshroom was outdated, but it's not really too big of a deal. You shouldn't have any of this. So you can see over here, I reduced the number of photos I was using to 389. And of those 389, Meshroom, Meshroom used 378. When you get to, I believe, prepare dense scene, you'll be able to see how many cameras it's going to use. And at that point, it's a good idea to make a judgment call. If it's using barely any of your photos, that means they're probably not good enough for Meshroom to be able to figure it out. And it's a good idea to stop the scan. But if it's using a good chunk of them, chances are it'll work out pretty well. And as you can see over here in the 3D viewer, it maps out all those different cameras. And a lot of these were probably redundant. As you can see, they're very close to one another. But again, I wanted to play on the safe side. So once your scan has finished, you'll see this button down here that says load model. You can go ahead and click that. It's going to take a second. And then up here, you're going to want to hide the structure from motion to get rid of that depth map. And then you can see your model. And this looks like it came out pretty good. I'm happy with this. However, this has millions of vertices. So we're going to have to bring this into instant meshes in order to make a low poly version of it. So in order to figure out where this file went, if you click on this texturing node and you scroll down, you'll see output mesh. This is the folder path to where the file will be. So now we're going to move over into instant meshes and we're going to bring this object in. So installing instant meshes is very similar to the process of installing Meshroom. You'll get a zip file and inside of it will be a folder that you'll extract to wherever you want it. And then inside of that folder will be the executable file. And this is what you'll see when you first open instant meshes. So you're going to want to go over here to open mesh. 
and then you're going to want to navigate to that output file now my path has the name of the object depended on I'm just going to delete that and here it is right here and then click open this will probably take a minute because again it's really high poly so just give your computer a second and try not to click anywhere or you may crash the software all right so my model is loaded in another thing I should probably note is you can see that it got kind of messed up down here on the bottom and that's kind of one of the downfalls of not scanning the bottom of the object it's not really a big deal though because the bottom will be hidden by the ground and I'll remove that in this low poly model later on in blender so once you're in meshroom there's a few things to look at here the remesh as is if you want it to be quads or tries in my case I think tries will do fine for me so I'm gonna go ahead and select that now right here target vertex count is what you're trying to get the uh, vertice count down to so right now it's at 80 it's uh, set to try and reduce it to 81.57 thousand vertices which is way too much I'm gonna bring it down to somewhere around 5,000 5,025 should be okay for my uses if you're trying to make this for a game or something along those lines you may want to reduce it even further but in my case this should do just fine then you're gonna want to go here and click solve and then go down here and click solve and you get this texture applied to the object that kind of shows you what the geometry is going to look like now this is a really quick and simple way to retopologize an object and depending on what you're doing it may or may not work for you if you're trying to make an object that you're going to be deforming or animating you may want more fine-tuned control over the retopologizing process and there are many ways to retopologize an object but in my case this works for me I'm just making a simple static mesh to be used inside of blender and so I really don't care too much about having fine-tuned control over the geometry so long as it's low poly and the geometry is generally clean which it looks like it's going to be so if you're happy with the way this looks you're gonna go here to export mesh and first you're gonna click extract mesh and you'll see you now have that low poly mesh you're gonna hit save and you're gonna choose a place to save it I made another folder inside of my project and I called it retopo but one thing to keep in mind is you actually have to type the extension .obj or you're going to get an error. I don't know why this is. It's kind of weird. Normally it would just do it automatically, but just make sure to do that and hit save. I already have mine saved, so I'm not going to do it again. But once you've done that, it's time to move on to Blender 2.8. Okay, so now we're inside of Blender 2.8. The first thing I'm going to do is select everything and delete it. I'm going to go over here to the render tab and change my render en engine to cycles and device to GPU compute. It's probably a good idea at this point to save your project. So I'm going to do that. All right. So now we have to import that high poly model that we got out of Meshroom. So you're going to go to file, import, obj, and you're going to navigate to that file. It's this textured mesh.obj right here. Now, once you click this import button, Blender may freeze and it's a good idea to just not touch anything for a few minutes and just let Blender try and process this. It's a huge file and it depends on your computer settings, but I find that even if Blender does stop responding, if you leave it alone long enough, it will open the file. If you click anywhere, it's definitely going to crash Blender. So here we go. Import. And I'm going to speed it up. Okay, so my object loaded. And it looks pretty good. It's oriented all weird. And Meshroom just tends to output it that way. I'm not really sure why. So if you know, leave a comment in the description down below. But I'm not going to change anything about this orientation. Because we want the high poly and the low poly to be right on top of one another. I also really recommend you not going into edit mode for this object. Because again, it's really high in geometry. And it could crash your software. So this object's loaded in. We're now going to import the low poly object that we got out of instant meshes. So I'm going to go again, file, import, obj, and I'm going to navigate to that file. And I'm going to import this. And there it is. So they're sitting right on top of one another, which is good. It's what we want. Uh, there's a few things we have to do before we can start baking. So I'm going to hide over here in the collection the high poly mesh well, actually first I'm gonna rename this to low poly and then the textured mesh I'm gonna name high poly 
just to stay organized and I'm going to hide the high poly. So you're going to select your low poly mesh and you're going to go into edit mode. And as you can see, instant mesh is marked all the edges as hard edges, which we don't want. So we're going to go up here to edge and we're going to cl click clear sharp. And now the object is smooth, which is what we do want. Now, the last thing I'm going to do before I get into the baking process is I'm going to delete some of this messiness down here. Okay, so it's certainly not perfect, but it serves my purpose well. Again, this bottom part's not really a big deal to me. It's going to be hidden by grass and uh, the ground, so I'm fine with the way this looks right now. So now what I'm going to do is quickly go around the bottom here and mark a seam. Okay, and then I'm going to also mark a seam going up his back. Now... When you're marking seams, it's going to depend on the object that you have. It's a good idea to try and hide them in the harsh edges. This object doesn't really have a lot of harsh edges, though, and the back of it's not going to be seen. So for my purposes, going right up the back is fine for me. So that's what I'm going to do. And it's quick and dirty, but it will work for this tutorial. So now I'm going to select all, go U, unwrap, and let's go over to the UV editing tab and have a look at it. And this is pretty much exactly what I want it to look like in my case. So I'm happy with this. And it's time to prepare for baking. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the baking process, basically we can take the texture information from this high poly mesh and we can bake it down onto this low poly mesh. That includes the diffuse, which is just the color information and the normal information. So all that, all those like, all that sculpted detail, all the little tiny details that makes this model so high poly will get baked into a normal map so that we can still see that visually on this low poly mesh but without the need for heavy processing so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the uv editing tab again and we're going to click new now i'm going to make this 8192 by 8192 and i'm going to call this diffuse bake alpha can stay checked and generated type blank is good click ok and then you're going to go up here to image, save as, and I'm going to go into my retopo folder and I'm going to save this as diffusebake.png. All right, now I'm going to go to the shading tab and with my low poly mesh selected, I'm going to add an image texture and I'm going to select that image that we just created, the diffuse bake. But I'm not going to plug it in. I'm just going to leave it like that. All right. So now there's one more thing I'm going to do here. I'm going to bake from a cage. If you're unfamiliar with this concept, there are a lot of tutorials on it. And I'll briefly go through it here. But I think that'll give us the best results for this model. Basically, wherever the model is clipping through here is going to cause problems with the uh, bake. You're going to get a bunch of artifacts and glitches in your texture. And baking from a cage really helps to reduce this. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to go back here to the layout tab. And we're going to hide this high poly for a moment here. And we're going to duplicate this low poly. Your cage has to have the exact same geometry as your low poly mesh. All the same number of vertices and edges and whatnot in order for this to work. So I'm going to name this duplicated model cage. I'm going to turn the high poly back on. And then with the cage selected, I'm going to go into edit mode. And with everything here selected, I'm going to hit Alt S to scale by the normals. And then just slowly drag this out until there's no clipping going on. You want it to be as close as possible without any clipping. And this looks pretty good to me. Alright. So now, I'm going to go to the low poly here. I'm going to select the low poly, go to the shading tab, make sure this node that we added before is selected. I'm going to go to the render tab and down to bake. And I'm going to change it from combined to diffuse because that's the first map we'll be baking. And then we're going to uncheck direct and indirect. 
we're not baking any kind of lighting data we're just baking the texture color so in this case we can put our render samples down to one then i'm going to tick this box here that says selected to active go to the drop down here and then check this box that says cage and select our cage i'm also going to set the extrusion to one just for good measure okay now that that's all done since we have selected to active what we have to do is go over here to the scene collection tab click the high poly and then shift click the low poly and if everything looks the way it does for me you can go ahead and click bake and you'll see it begin right here it shouldn't take too long the higher resolution your image is the longer it'll take but overall it usually takes under a minute for me all right so my big finish so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go back over to the uv editing tab and it always likes to put me in edit mode for the high poly when i do this i'm not really sure why but let's tab out of that and here is our baked image texture and this looks pretty good to me i think maybe there's a little artifact right here uh, it could just also be the geometry of the mesh but it's fine in my case i'm okay with it so make sure you go up to here to image you'll see this little star next to it which means that it's changed but it hasn't been saved so you're going to click on that and click save now we can go back to the shading tab and we can plug that image texture in. I'm just going to hide the low poly and or the I'm sorry, the high poly in the cage. And I'm going to turn my roughness all the way up because this is a fully rough model. And that looks pretty good to me. So now we have to bake the normal map. Uh, there are certain areas where there's a lot of detail missing, like right here near his hand. And on this uh, this club that he's holding, all the little bumps and whatnot. All right, so we're pretty much just going to repeat that process. We're going to go over to the UV editing. We're going to X out of this image, and we're going to click new. We're going to call this normal underscore bake uh, 8192 by 8192 alpha blank. Okay. And then image save as normal underscore bake dot PNG. Okay. Then we're going to go back to the shading tab for the low poly object, add an image, and in the drop down here, select the normal that we just created. All right, now we're going to turn our cage and our high poly back on. We're going to select the high poly, select the low poly. Now in the bake settings, we're going to change it from diffuse to normal. And everything should be set automatically. Uh, if you don't see the cage here, make sure to set your cage. Uh, but if everything looks good, you can go ahead and click bake. Okay, and once that finishes, we're going to go back over to UV editing. Have a look at it. It looks pretty good to me. So I'm going to go up here to image, save as, normal bake.png, or you could have just clicked save doesn't really make a difference either way just as long as you save the image and go back to shading and I'm gonna add a normal map node make sure to set this normal to non color data and then plug into the normal map node and real quick I'm gonna before I plug this in I'm gonna turn off the cage and the high poly so we can see the effect and here it goes and all that detail is now put into this low poly mesh. And that's really all there is to this tutorial. When it comes to things like roughness, there are a lot of ways that people will go about generating them. Uh, in this video, I'm not really going to go through any of that. Uh, in my case, my model is completely rough. There's pretty much no glossiness on this. So this is it for me. This is finished. And I quite like the way it came out. Again, things like this down here are messy and could be done better. And it probably would have been a better idea to just scan the bottom of it, but I really didn't want to risk messing up the statue. But overall, this came out pretty good. And I'm happy with it. Now, we have a low-poly model that's completely usable and won't crash your computer. So if you like this video and it helped you, uh, consider slapping a like on it. I know there's not much going on in my channel at the moment. I am fairly new at uploading videos in this space, but I have a lot of other cool tricks up my sleeve. So if you're interested in seeing what I have to offer in the future, maybe consider subscribing. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please post them down below. 
and I'll see you in the next video.